Hello, welcome to another Sonic Lab. Uh, as you can see in here, that's the sound of the Roland Ira System 1 DSP synthesizer. Uh, it's up to four voice polyphony. For the full skinny, uh, there's part one of the review, which goes through the nuts and bolts of the unit. Uh, sorry, it's been a long time coming for part two, but uh, the plug out technology, which is an additional, uh, quite major part of this, was not available to me at the time. That firmware has now been updated and I can now have a look at that. In the first part of the review, I kind of took a look at the nuts and bolts and the structure. I had a few caveats. I've been living with the synthesizer a little bit longer now and there's a few other things I just wanted to draw your attention to. And also there were a couple of points in the comments that I wanted to address. Something that is quite critical to the way this works and it's sort of a return almost to the old school Roland style. Uh, remembering that the firmware has now been updated to this. Uh, each of these knobs and each of the buttons and everything transmits MIDI data. So if I just bring my screen up here, we can see that all of the knobs transmit something. And that's actually something that's quite useful because as in the old school days, uh, there used to be a thing called an edit buffer, which you'd see in things like D110s and JV1080s and a combination of buttons would dump all of the live parameters of a currently edited patch into your sequencer. So you could recall it and meant you didn't have to store every tweak you made. Similarly with the uh, system one, pressing and holding the manual button creates a bulk dump of all of the control parameters. You can see there that's essentially the status of all of the front panel controls. So effectively you can take current state, dump it into your sequencer and have it sort of replay back. Unfortunately there's no way of turning that data into patch memories. You are still limited by having only eight patch memories. Though you can now uh, drag and drop patches between the system one and your computer over USB. Uh, I suppose actually, if you think about it, if you take the plug out in, into the equation as well, you've actually got eight patches per instance. So for the system one and also the plug out. So that mention of the plug out is no doubt got your mouth watering because this is ultimately what it's all about. Obviously we've seen what the synth can do itself on its own. Um, and now we've also got the SH-101 plug out, which you'll also notice I happen to have an original SH-101 here, which we can compare it to. But before we do that, there were a couple of comments in the section, uh, particularly there's one from a chap called Kevin Nolan who wanted to know about the PWM function, because uh, certainly in previous Roland synths of this generation, there's been an issue with aliasing uh, on higher notes. So let's check that out. Right, so let's get up a square wave. Bring the LFO into place get some modulation going on uh, and see what happens when we start to crank it up. Bring the rate up. It does sound like there could be a little bit of that, although it's, it's hard to tell because we're going so supersonic. So now let's get straight onto the plug out because that's another part of the main feature. And for those who don't know, the plug out is uh, the ability to store effectively another DSP imprint of another instrument inside the system one by the, pressing the plug out button. Uh, this doesn't have to be hooked up to the computer. The computer is required to dump the DSP code into the system one, but once you've done it, you can just play it as a standalone instrument. That's very worth mentioning. So what we have here is a plug out button. Uh, I've already installed the SH-101 into the system. So when I press the plug out, now what happens is the display is grayed, buttons that don't do anything uh, are dimmed. But before we get too excited about plug outs, there is a couple of gotchas. I mean, one of the reasons this review was a little bit late is because I had trouble getting the uh, plug out to work in my system. Granted, I'm a little bit behind the curve, but basically it comes in audio units and VST3 versions. So actually during the process of this review, the plug out was updated because while I started the review, uh, the AU version of the plug out was only available in 64 bit and worked in Logic X. And I had to use a 64 bit version of Ableton Live to demonstrate, which is what I'm using here. Uh, but it's been updated, as I say, and now the list of compatible DAWs is available on the site. Let's take a look at them. So now compatibles are in Windows 8.17, Steinberg Cubase 7.5, Sonar X3, Persona Studio 1, 2, ImageLine FL Studio 11. And on the Mac, Logic Pro X 64-bit, Ableton Live 32-bit, that should also read 64-bit, uh, Live 9 Lite 32, Persona Studio 1 and Steinberg Cubase 64-bit. 
So certainly not every DAW is supported and hopefully Roland will be able to increase that range with future updates. Uh, however, because they're using VST3, there's going to be a limitation inherent in the DAWs that don't already support that. So I guess you're going to have to wait until your DAW does support it if it currently doesn't. So once you've instantiated your plug out, uh, you've got a few options. You can set it to be uh, red or grey or... Uh or system one layout, so it'll just show you roughly what that looks like. But the main thing is this button here, this is the plug out button, and clicking that, what that does is ready to plug out, and that will now send data to the SH-101. In this instance, I've already got it installed, and I don't actually know how to deinstall it to show you how to install it, but it takes probably 10, 15 seconds to sort of squirt the code into it. And once you're done, you can unplug the computer and to all intents and purposes, you have the SH-101 model in your system. So let's get down to it. Let's see what they sound like. This now is the SH-101 plug out on the system one. Kind of uh, funky bass lead type sound. And this is the same sound. I mean, bearing in mind, I've, you know, it's not going to be that easy to get them precise. Now, if I play... To my ears, that actually sounds pretty damn close. And just to double check on here, I've got the tone, which can affect the overall sound of the uh, system one right here. So I can beef it up even more. But basically, you know, this is a 30 plus year old piece of technology. This is brand new DSP. But let's get the scope up as well and see what the waveforms look like. So the green is the SH-101 and rather unintuitively the yellow is the SH-101 plug out. So E, next E up. They sound pretty damn close. Now let's just go with a square square wave there, turn it down here and bring the square slight difference, there's a slight spike on the rising edge of the square a bit more buzz to my ears but this could be you know down to the age of the electronics, I mean bear in mind this synthesizer is if you tap it too hard the pitch wobbles all over the place i can't say that this is a sort of concourse a pristine version of an sh101 it's probably not the one you might want to use if you were going to model one but it is an sh1 nonetheless and the one thing i have found that between them they really do sound very very similar i mean just do a, a sweep bring resonance up to maybe 50 percent on both Maybe three quarters. Hundred percent. Now, this is where generally you're going to get some di disparity in the calibration. So to my ears, that actually sounds pretty bang on. I've got some big monitors in this room and I didn't notice any bottom end drop off, which is something that you can quite often hear the difference between an analog modeled and an analog. And bearing in mind, this is an actual analog synthesizer and this is DSP coming out of some D2As. So the boffins back in Japan or wherever it is the laboratories are, have done a pretty good job of making these absolutely bang on to my ears. The only thing is there's going to be some slight calibrations but on an open square wave on both I found I had to just drop the, uh, the, the filter just down a little bit to 
get the brightness the same, but it could be that this guy is just old and knackered and is quite possibly the case. But of course, we've also got the instances in the computer which we can run as many as we like uh, in our DAW, assuming we've got a compatible one. And just a quick look at how this works. Uh, we've got the patch management, so we can store up to 64 presets. These one in green are the eight plug out memories that will run in the hardware when we sync them up. And we can drag any one that we like into that list so that it'll become one of the eight that we want. And while we're in subject of the computer, we should also mention that the system one comes with USB audio interface as standard. This is a 24-bit 96K 2-in, two 2-out, two so it's high sample rate, uh, and it plugs into the computer, Windows, Mac, or PC, but the only problem is, and this is something that is common to a lot of Roland stuff, it's not class compliant, and I don't know why that is. I really do wish it was, because there is a danger, and it has happened before, let's face it, where if the drivers aren't updated, so in two or three or five or 10 years' time, you want to plug in this and keep using it, if the drivers haven't been updated, then you're not going to be able to plug it in. You're going to have to work it on an old machine. And that's something that I think is a shame. I think, Roland, if you're listening, class compliant drivers, please, for both MIDI and audio. Because let's face it, we could plug this into our iPad as well. And then we'd have all sorts of fun and games. So one area of the set that we haven't really dwelt on at all is the control section, the scatter, and the arpeggio. So this is it. It does rather deviate from the norm. We don't have a pitch bend and a mod wheel. But in normal operation, the outer ring of the scatter wheel is pitch bend, up and down with a center dent, and then there's a little mod button here which we can introduce modulation. If we bring the arpeggiator in, we've obviously got uh, up and down one octave, up, up and down two octave, the steps which go into triplets so we can affect the resolution, and then the scatter wheel. Now the scatter wheel we can choose from 10 different scatters, and generally speaking, if you push it to the right, it gets more complicated and faster, and to the left, simpler. If we look at the overall picture, we can see that the flashing parameters are also modulated depending on what the scatter is doing. So it's adding, opening up the filter, Turn it left. It's changing bit crush and so on and so forth. On the face of it, this is actually quite a complex and um, pretty useful modulation matrix that could potentially be, but I couldn't find any reference on how to program it, uh, which would have been really useful. We could have ended up with these kind of macros based on this wheel in scatter mode that would affect all sorts of parameters in positive and negative ways. But um, as I say, there's no online manual and I didn't receive a manual with this one, so it's very hard for me to comment as to how much potential that is. But on the face of it that I'm seeing here, it's probably the least useful of all the scatter functions uh, across the range. Well, what do I think? Certainly, it's unconventional. The fact that we've got this short travel keyboard is going to turn some people off, if not many. There's also the fact that uh, we haven't got a pitch and mod wheel. Uh, velocity sensitivity is available via external MIDI, uh, but you can't map that to any of the filter functions or any other parameters. So there are limitations, but I think what Roland have done is, you know, it's quite, they've followed their own way, and that's the sort of thing that they basically do. They have bucked the trend a little bit by going DSP, but, you know, listening to the sound of the SH-101 and the plug out, it really is almost indistinguishable from the original. So if they get this right and start bringing out more synthesizers and make the price of additional plug-outs good value, I'm not sure how feasible that is because I imagine there's a lot of work into getting a model that good, then I think they've got a winner on their hands. Uh, it's obviously 599 US dollars, about 479, 480 quid in the UK. You know, it's a chunk of change, but you are getting a 96K audio interface, you're buying into this whole system, I guess time will tell as to whether or not we get a big library of instruments that make it a really interesting, exciting platform. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to stay up to date with what we release in videos, we do a lot of videos, at least one a video a week with Sonic Talk, plus our reviews, interviews, and all the other stuff, please subscribe to the channel. There will be a button appearing on the screen here. Right now, I'm just going to play out with something I can knock together as I've got an SH-101 here and a System 1. Just going to play out and see what happens. <laughs>